Welcome to the new 5-Minute Bible Study Series, How to Study the Bible. In this series, I'm going to go through several different episodes, helping you, an average Bible reader, understand what preachers like myself do to take the passage that we've read that's really troubling us and coming to an understanding of it. I want you to take yourself back in time to you were sitting in a church pew somewhere and the preacher told you, you might have even banged on the pulpit and said, you need to be studying the Bible. But how many times have they actually gone on to tell you how to do that? You know, if somebody says, read the Bible, I mean, there are tips to reading the Bible. We're going to share some in this series, but that's pretty straightforward. How you go from reading the Bible to understanding those difficult passages is quite a different story. And so in this series, I want to give you five main points to take with you and put in your back pocket. The first one is to prioritize Bible study. Number two, choose a Bible for your Bible study. Read the Bible. And the big one, number four, this is the one that's going to take most of our attention. That is systematically study the Bible. And then finally, live the Bible. The last point being, if we have all this headspace knowledge, but we don't actually have a practical outlet for it, then what good is it? And so I hope this Bible study series is beneficial to you. If you ever ask the question, how do I study the Bible for myself? This is for you. Okay, so let's get going here. I love to start projects. It's usually about three quarters into the way that you get tired, you get run down, and it's difficult to finish. But let's get started here and stay with me through the end. The first thing, like I said, is to prioritize the Bible. That's where your Bible study starts. You've got to make it a priority. If you don't make it a priority, you're probably not going to do it. I can share all of this information with you, but you as the listener have to take all of this and say, I'm going to do this. I want to study the Bible. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it a priority. Now, I've been told, I don't know if the statistic is true, but 92% of people that set goals never finish them. I would say, if that's true, that the percentage of people that never set goals in the first place never finish, <laughs> never finish them. I mean, that just seems natural. I believe with my whole heart, if you want to do something, you need to set a goal. Now, there are different things to go into that, and this part of this Bible study series is not really Bible study. It's just something you need to do before you even get started. I would encourage you, to set two spiritual goals. I don't care what time of year this is that you're reading this. If it hopefully at the beginning of the year, then great. Right out of the gate, set two spiritual goals and one physical goal. And right at the top of those spiritual goals, make those number one. If you don't get the physical goal done, that's okay, but get your spiritual goals done. And the first one needs to be a Bible reading goal. If you want to understand your Bible, that's what we're all about here, okay? After you make that spiritual goal, the next one needs to be some type of Bible study goal. So I'm going to give you the freedom to choose those for yourself. But every year, my Bible reading goal, number one, I'm going to get it done, is I'm going to read my Bible all the way through. That's going to get done. Whatever else happens, happens. But that is my priority. And I can teach you this from a passage of Scripture from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Listen to me. Paul says to Timothy, for bodily exercise profits a little. Now stop right there. Notice he does say that bodily exercise does profit. Okay, It's not like he's saying lifting weights has absolutely no value to it. Even an inspired apostle says there is some value to that. But his point is that this is not the most important thing in your Christian walk. Okay, So let's start again. For bodily exercise profits a little... But here's where you make your real gains, Timothy. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. So what Paul's saying here by application is make two spiritual goals to every one physical goal. If you want to ask yourself, what does this mean to me? After I take the text, understand what it's saying, and apply it to my life, this is a little process that you'll be familiar with by the end of the series. This means set two spiritual goals and one physical uh, one physical goal. And if I don't get that physical goal done, that's okay. But I better get my Bible reading goal done. And I need to start making routines of Bible study. If I don't set goals for those, I'm probably not going to achieve them. Another passage that I want to read before we're done with this little step here is from Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. 
And as we read this, this is a description of the early church's establishment and development. I want you to place yourself, hopefully you're a member of a local congregation. If you're not, reach out to 5-Minute Bible Study and I can point you to one. But hopefully you are, and you go to this congregation, I want you to read this passage, and the church at Thessalonica, I want you to imagine that you're that church that Paul speaks about here, or really Luke writing this speaks to uh, about the Thessalonian church. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. The church where I attend is called the Chapel Grove Church of Christ. So I'm going to insert that into where it says the church at Thessalonica or those in Thessalonica who are not as fair-minded as those in Berea. Wow. For the rest of history, in the inspired scripture, the Thessalonians get called out. Hashtag don't be like Thessalonica. If you're uh, on social media and you know what a hashtag is, it's I I would be embarrassed. I would be very embarrassed if that was the Chapel Grove Church of Christ, and he went down the road and he said, "This church over here in Nashville, uh, we went there and they were more fair-minded than those at the Chapel Grove Church of Christ down in Summertown, Tennessee." I would just be embarrassed. But this is just speaking facts. The Holy Spirit's just speaking facts right here, and he's showing the importance of a Christian, and in this case, a local group of Christians, studying the Word and verifying from the Scriptures themselves whether what they were being told and preached to by Paul and Silas was actually true. And those people are commended. Those people are doing what is their Christian duty. So perhaps, like we said in the introductory video, perhaps a preacher has gotten in the pulpit and he said, you need to study the Bible. But he hasn't told you how to do it. Well, no more excuses. I'm telling you how to do it. So let's be like those in Berea and let's get on to learning how do we start reading the Bible. Where do we start? What are some tips we need? Coming up next. In the last video, I said that reading the Bible would be the next thing we discuss. But let's first stop and talk about actually choosing a Bible to study out of. And this may seem elementary. You may think, is there really any science that goes into this? But the answer is yes, absolutely. Choose the right Bible. Now, I'm not going to go into extensive detail in this. There is a five-minute Bible study podcast, and on that podcast, episode five is How to Choose a Bible, where I spend over 30 minutes answering this question. But I'm going to share with you some of just the key facts from that podcast episode with you here. I want to talk to you just for a second about translation theory, and that is why are there so many different Bible translations? The answer to that question is people have tried to take the Bible and make it understandable for the average reader. But all the while, some people are more concerned with making the Bible as accurate from its original language as possible. And when you make the Bible and you translate it from Greek into English, and if you were to do it uh, word for word, take the Greek phrase, write it in English, give that to the people. That sounds great. That would be what we call, it's called a Greek interlinear, where literally there are, there are Bible translations called Greek interlinear translations, the Greek phrase above, the English phrase below, and that sounds great. The problem with that is you can't read that fluidly as a regular English reader. Even if you were not an average English reader, uh, you were a scholar, to read that would be very difficult. It would be very broken because Greek word order, uh, there, it's not concerned as much with word order as English is. And so it's very difficult. It would be very choppy. There's supplied words you'd have to supply in order to understand the Greek and it's just a difficult process to read a very literal translation. So what Bible translators have done in the English is they have uh, translated the Bible based off the theory of let's translate the Bible to get the actual words into the people's hands, but in such a way that they can read it and understand it easily. More translations come out every so few years uh, trying to update the Bible translation using the common language of the day, the new modern English. And sometimes translators will try to be too contemporary. They will try to, uh, rather than give a more of a word-for-word, -word, essentially literal translation, they'll shoot for more of a thought-for-thought uh, -thought and kind of adding commentary onto the translation as well. 
So if you were to look at this chart here, you'll notice on the far left of the chart, there's the Greek interlinear. That would be as literal a translation as you're going to find, but not easy to read. And as you f move further to the right, you, you see there translations that get more away from literal translation to free, liberal, loose, thought-for-thought -thought translation to where on the far right of that spectrum is the message. And the message isn't even a translation. The message, I would call the message a paraphrase or just a commentary on the Bible. It's not the Bible. So uh, you can see there how different translations, they get further and further away. That gives you an idea of what Bible you're holding in your hands. Is it a literal translation or is it what would better be phrased an essentially literal translation? So here's what I want you to take away from all this, okay? All that may have just sounded like garble mush to you. Take everything I just said. There's the theory, and this is what you need to know. Pick up a Bible that is as literal as you can get while at the same time easily understanding it, okay? Get a Bible that is as close to the left of this spectrum that you can find, meaning it's essentially literal, but it's also one that you can readily understand. And if you'll do that, first of all, if you can't understand the Bible, then you're probably not going to read it. And so you might have to read something that's a little uh, less literal, like, for example, maybe an NIV or maybe the Christian Standard Bible, less literal than the New American Standard Bible or the New King James Bible. But if you can understand that one and if you'll read it, then do that. But here's the other thing. Read from that translation, but study from multiple translations. Never study from just the Bible that you regularly read from. What I mean by that is when you come across a Bible verse that you, man, I don't know what this means. I really got to get down, start using the tips that Aaron gave me in this Bible study series. Then I want you to do this. Pull out several different translations. Pull out a New American Standard Bible. Pull out a New King James Version. Pull out a, an NIV as well and compare them all. We'll put this in at practice in just a minute as we go through a passage of the Bible in Isaiah 28. Hang with us, but we'll come back to this point. Coming up next, tips you need to know about reading your Bible. Okay, here we go. Tips you need to know about reading the Bible. Again, this seems pretty straightforward, but if you've had difficulty reading through the Bible all the way, certain sections of the Bible, whatever, here's some things to help you out. The first thing I would tell you is to make it your long-term goal. I don't care if you just got baptized into Christ. I don't care if you've been a member of the church for 25 years. Your long-term goal should be to have read the Bible all the way through before you die. I'll tell you why. My father tells this story when he was a very young preacher. I want to say maybe 20 years old. And he knocked on somebody's door. The man answered and in the process of their conversation, this older gentleman that he was talking to asked him, have you ever read the Bible all the way through? My dad was a preacher of the gospel working with the local church, and he had not. And he couldn't lie to him, and he was so embarrassed, he told him, no, I haven't. And the man said, why should I even listen to you then? Now, understand that he was a preacher, and you may not be a preacher, but you need to be able to, if you're going to convert people if, to Christ, if you're going to preach the gospel and share the gospel on the daily like we should be doing, then you need to be able to have a ready answer to that question too. And if the answer is, no, I can't say I have, then you need to get working on that. That's something that every single Christian should be expecting to do on the daily, on the yearly, is reading their Bible all the way through. Not only so nobody can tell you that or ask you that question in the negative, but simply to understand the Bible. If you want to understand the Bible, you want to study the Bible, how can you study and learn and know what you've never read? So let's keep that one forefront of our minds. I would say this though, if you've never read the Bible through, a lot of people give out around Exodus 25 to 30, where there's all these architectural dimensions of the tabernacle and everything. And I understand that's pretty boring, if, especially if you have no context of why all that's important. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's a pretty tough section. Doesn't take long to get there from your starting from Genesis. So I would tell you to start off, uh, whether you start off in Genesis, whether you start off in Matthew, make it where you read bite-sized chunks, easily digestible small portions of Scripture. 
So, for example, the New Testament is broken down into the Gospels, into the books of history, which is really just one, Acts, the Pauline epistles, the epistles of Paul. Then there's the general epistles like James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, John, the epistles of John, Jude, and then finally the book of prophecy and revelation. So make it your goal at the beginning of this year. Maybe you need to just stick with, let's read through the Gospels this year. If you've never read through even just a couple of books of the Bible, make sure you get the Gospels read. And then go to the next section until you systematically work through the whole Bible. It would be better to take a little more time to read through the Bible completely than to keep failing at the same goal and never having read through the Bible at all. I would tell you that first of all. The second thing is a tip that I got from John MacArthur. John MacArthur is a preacher in the Baptist church, and I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff, but he does have a lot of good helpful techniques and tips on Bible reading and studying the Bible. Here's one of them I got from him. He says, if you want to understand the Bible, get a set of flashcards, so some blank 3 by 5 note cards. And this is what you're going to do. Make it your goal to read through a book of the Bible every single month. Not just once, but every single day of that month, read through that book every day. If it's a small book, you can do that, like 1 John. It has only five chapters. It's only about six pages, depending on the size of the font of your Bible. And you can read through that every single day for 30 days, and that'll take about 15 to 20 minutes of each day. If you'll then take the flashcard and write on it the theme of the chapter and each chapter in the book and review those flashcards every single day after you've done your reading, by the time the 30 days are complete, believe me, you will understand what's in that book. You'll know the theme of each chapter in the book. You'll know the book. For larger books of the Bible like the Gospels, break those down into about six-page divisions, whatever would be equivalent of reading the book of 1 John. Find whatever amount that would be, and for that month, read, say, the first four chapters of Luke for 30 days. Go through the flashcards for those chapters covered, and so on. In about two and a half to three years, you can get through the entire New Testament. And that is a very achievable goal, but it's not for beginners. I would say this is for intermediate to expert Bible students. Um, this would be a great goal for you to take your Bible study to the next level, level sorry, and better understand God's will. And so this is something I'm trying at the beginning of 2022. If you'd like to try it too, reach out to me and tell me that you're doing it. It would be great encouragement to me. Yes, I need encouragement too, and then hopefully I can encourage you. Those are some things to take into consideration, um, but definitely, before you're done, uh, definitely have a goal in mind to read through the Bible all the way through. And I will add one more thing to this. As you're reading through the Bible, now this is going to encourage you from year to year. If you're reading through your Bible every year, or even less frequently, as you're reading through, get a Bible that you can write in the margins. And in the margins, you're going to have questions that come up. And those questions you're not going to know the answers to, and it may be some time before you find the answer. And so write the question down in the side margin of your Bible. Then the next time you come through, you'll see that question, and maybe if you attend church faithfully, you'll have heard the answer to that question from the pulpit at church. Maybe you'll have found the answer from later reading on in your Bible, or from other Bible studies, or from talking to people, as you go through the Bible the second time and you come across these questions in the margins, you'll find out that you have found the answer to some of those questions, and that will be a proof to you that you are actually growing in your knowledge of the Word. I think that's a great, great study tip that many people do not take advantage of and will aid you in your personal growth of Bible study. That's all for reading the Bible this time, so now comes the big meat part of this series, the part I'm really excited to share with you. These are the nine tips, the nine steps to systematic Bible study coming up next. Okay, let's get going here on systematic Bible study. Again, these are the nine tips, nine tips in total for how to study the Bible systematically. And by that, what I mean is to how to study a section of scripture systematically. What we're going to do in the next several episodes is I'm going to take the passage in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10. We're going to read that passage, and then we're going to explain that using these nine different tips. Now, in this passage, we won't be able to actually apply all nine tips. You'll understand why 
when we get to it. But if you will use these nine tips for any passage you come across, you will understand how all of them will play a part eventually and are important to your Bible study and understanding the text. So let's do that. There's a difficult passage in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10. And what I want to do is I want to back up a little bit before verse 9 to set the scene a little bit to verse 7, read the text, and then we'll get into applying step number 1. So let's read the passage. Let's actually start in verse 1, and we're going to read all the way through verse 10. It says there, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And the glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an observer sees, he eats it up while it's still in his hand. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment, and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. But they are also have erred through wine, and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. So from just reading the text initially, and I'm reading from the New King James Version here, we see that somebody's in trouble. It started off in verse 1 talking to Ephraim. And these people in Ephraim are mainly what I remember from having read it is that they're drunk, they're intoxicated, they're so drunk they're vomiting. Um, these people are entrenched in immoral behavior. We come now to verses 9 and 10, which is the main text we want to understand here, a statement that's kind of puzzling at first, but hopefully by the end of applying these study tips, you'll understand what it means. So let's read verses 9 and 10. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So what does the verse mean that says precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little? That's a statement that I've heard commented on before. And I thought to myself, that's kind of difficult to understand, but let's get down to the brass tacks and get it settled. I think that probably what I heard on this verse the first time was correct, but I really need to study it for myself to know that I've understood the Word of God. So let's, let's do this. The first thing that you're wanting to do, the first tip I would tell you, is to read the text in several different translations. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to share with you some slides that illustrate what I'm talking about and this video of me will be minimized for just a little bit. So look here, I've got the New King James on the left column. I've got the New International Version listed next. The New International Version is a little bit more free translation than the New King James, so that's going to give me a little bit more to look at. And as I read these two translations, one after the other, I'm going to notice a little bit of difference. I'll also notice that there's a footnote in the NIV. It has it in verse 10 there, and that footnote is labeled as an A. I'm telling you here things that you need to be paying attention to. Pay attention to footnotes. And also, that reminds me, get a center column reference Bible, which we'll appeal to in just a little bit in one of our tips. But that footnote should take you to the center column reference of your Bible, or maybe the footnote, depending on if your Bible has footnotes instead. And what it says here is that in Isaiah 28 and verse 10, there's this Hebrew phrase in verse 10, and they say, we don't really know how to translate it. it Probably, probably was a meaningless sound in the original language. And what it was meant to, to be by Isaiah's writing was to mimic the prophet's words or mimic the leaders of Israel and what they um, were saying in that day. Maybe you don't understand what that footnote means still yet, but keep on with me. We've read the footnote. Uh, it gives us a little bit of insight into what verse 10 means we'll get down to make that a little more clear as we go. So we keep on reading. The next thing we want to do is pull out a third translation. Always read, and this is my advice, always read at least three different translations on whatever text that you're studying. And when you do, 
look back at that little continuum of Bible translations, literal to paraphrase, and make sure that two of the three translations at least, meaning the majority, are literal translations or are essentially literal translations. And so I've chosen two very essentially literal translations, the New American Standard Bible to complement the New King James Version. And then there's the dynamic equivalent kind of more of a thought for thought translation in the NIV. And so as I compare these translations, I come across the commonalities and the differences. And in verse 10, you notice here the different ways that the translators translate for precept upon precept, precept upon precept. In the NIV, it says, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that. You can see that's a lot more contemporary English. Uh, not necessarily a good thing in all cases, but here it's more contemporary. Maybe it does help us understand the text a little bit better. And then verse 10 in the New American Standard says, order on order, order on order. And so reading different English um, synonyms that, that get the point across, that get the phrase, the idea across, Maybe we already understand what's being said here a little bit better. Me, at first, I didn't really grasp a whole lot more from comparing translations, and so on this verse at least. And so it, it may not prove itself profitable right out of the gate on every single verse of Scripture, but I promise you if you do this routinely, it will help you, and a lot of times this will help verify the single meaning of the passage. In the next video, I'm going to share with you point number two that you need to take into consideration in systematic Bible study. Point number two in systematic Bible study. You need to read an introduction of the book of the Bible that you're studying. In this case, we're studying Isaiah chapter 28. So find an introduction to the book of Isaiah since we're studying that book. There are many different books that you could read, but I want the audience right now to take into consideration who I'm talking to. Right now, if you are a teacher at church, um, yes, I'm talking to you too, but maybe you already have Bible study down and you're like, Aaron, I don't need to hear what you got to tell me. I'm already good. Now, I would say that even you could benefit from this, but I'm specifically targeting people who are, they go to church, they read their Bible, they don't understand, and they don't even know where to start studying. I'm specifically targeting you. And so what I'm asking you to do is look at simple resources. I could give you some introductions to books of the Bible that are really complex. They use a lot of big words. They're very deep. Some of them are very good and some of them aren't very good. Just because a book uses a lot of big words doesn't mean it's actually a good book. But what I want to do is give you some easy to use resources that will also capture your attention and help you stay tuned on your Bible study. So what I want to recommend to you is the Bible Project. Now the Bible Project is a Bible study resource that gives introductions to every single book of the Bible in the Old Testament and the New. And I want to take you through the screens on a desktop computer or laptop where you can navigate the website and get to an introduction of each book of the Bible. So here we go. It's called thebibleproject.com. That'll get you to their website. And this will be the home page. This watch icon right at the top, almost center of the page, you're going to click on that. And it's going to bring down this menu. On this menu, you're going to click on book overviews. And then the next screen will show you all of these icons giving you where you'll go click on to find an introduction to the book of Isaiah. What they're going to do is they're going to tell you everything about the book in a very short amount of time. I say everything. What you need to know about the book in terms of who wrote it, when it was written, where does that fall in the history of Israel, gives you the context for all the different messages of Isaiah throughout the book. He has a lot of rebuke to give the nation of Israel. He has a lot of restoration prophecies about future glory in the future. Well, what they do is they give you animated graphics that really bring it to life and help you understand the book. Now, sometimes I watch these videos, the Bible Project, very capturing, captivating your attention. And I think, man, I understand the book of Isaiah. Uh, I don't even need to read it. Now, you do need to go read the book. And ideally, if you have time, go and read the whole book. Now, in this case, Isaiah is 66 chapters. It's one of the longest books in the Old Testament. 
it's not going to be very easy for you to read the whole book necessarily. But definitely go and check out The Bible Project. Watch the video. This is step number two. If you would like more introductory, uh, or I should say introductions to books of the Bible in book form or even in video form, there are others available. Just reach out to me. Next, let's go on to step number three in systematic Bible study. Point number three in systematic Bible study is about outlining. You need to outline the text. Now, there are several different layers to this, but I would tell you if you are a congregational teacher, if you teach other people either in Bible study, uh, you give sermons at church, or maybe in this case you are just trying to understand a passage of the Bible, one of the most overlooked aspects of Bible study that I see in sermons particularly is lack of structure lack of outlining in general, but also add to that the fact that the Bible student has not outlined the text that they're studying. So that starts off with, you've watched your introduction on the Bible project, right? Okay, they make you feel like you know the book now. In that Bible project video, they're probably gonna give you an outline, some type of working outline to kinda break down the content of that book. Now I will say this about outlines of Bible books. There's not one outline that I think is like the only outline for that book. We categorize people according to their skin color, according to their accent, what language they speak, maybe what part of the country or world they live in, and not any one of those categories is the right category by which to categorize people, right? They all have their role, they're all useful. The same thing with how you might outline a book of the Bible. You might outline it according to um, its topics. You might outline it according to its literary flow. Uh, there are other different ways you might outline a book. But one resource that's very simple, again, easy to use, is a book called Nelson's Complete Book of Bible Maps and Charts. I've advertised this on my website before. You can find this book used at a pretty easy, cheap price, maybe around five bucks, right around there. Get that book for your Bible study in general. It will give you another resource with introductions to each book of the Bible, but more importantly on this step of outlining the book, it will give you an outline of each book of the Bible. And I like this one to recommend to, again, average Bible students, average Bible readers, because these outlines are pretty basic. They also make it graphically appealing to be able to visualize the flow of the book. And a lot of times the outlines have taught me quite a bit and I've been reading the Bible since I was just a, a little bitty boy. Uh, they still pr prove themselves useful to me. So as we look at Thomas Nelson's outline, what I'm looking at right here is it breaks it down into three main categories. The first 35 chapters is about the condemnation of Israel and the nations that are not Israel, Gentile nations, okay? The next set is chapters 36 to 39, and, and he says this is a historical interlude. And what that section really is, it's a narrative, uh, more reads more like a history instead of poetry, like you saw before when we read Isaiah 28. So this section reads more like a history book in these several chapters telling us things about King Hezekiah, who was the king during Isaiah's day. Uh, the next and last section is chapters 40 through 66, and Thomas Nelson says this tells us about the comfort and consolation that is to come for Israel after all the judgment has taken place. So that's a nice little breakdown on this particular passage in Isaiah 28. This doesn't really necessarily help us understand verses 9 and 10, but this is still helpful for kind of setting this chapter and these verses in a historical context. So this was not a waste of time. The next thing I would recommend to you is then go to Isaiah 28, the chapter you're going to, and read the text, which you've already done. Read the whole chapter. Now, in our reading, we only read the first 10 verses, but if I'm doing this actually on my own, I'm going to read the whole chapter, and I'm going to read it several times. After I read it several times, I'll see kind of the flow of thought of Isaiah as he goes on from one thought to the next. And what I would recommend you to do is to write down, after you've read it maybe four and five times, I would recommend 20 times, but after you've read it and you become familiar with the flow and transition of thought, write down your own outline of the verse, or rather of the chapter, and mine looks something like this. Verses 1 through 4, God rebukes Ephraim for the first time. Verses 5 and 6, God's glory and judgment of Ephraim is described. 
verses 7 through 8, God rebukes Ephraim again. In verses 9 through 15, and these are the verses that contain the section that we're focusing on, God's effort to save and teach Ephraim, uh, but yet their rejection of that is explained, it's described here in these verses. And then the rest of the outline goes on. So that's what I did. I just read the text, and in my own words, this, these are my words. I didn't get this from Thomas Nelson. I didn't get this from the Bible Project. I want to use my own words to explain in an easy-to-understand way what each section is telling me. Now, I will give you one last hint before we move on from this point, and that is your Bible, depending on the editor, will help you out here. And maybe you can see this on my Bible and, and look at your own, but for example, on Isaiah chapter 28, notice there's a gap in between verse, the end of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5. You'll also notice there's a gap at the end of verse 6 and before verse 7 starts. You'll notice another gap between verses 8 and 9 and another one between verses 10 and 11. This is very helpful. And most of the time, the editor is pretty accurate. These gaps are to show you where the editor believes that there is a transition in thought. So if they were all just read without any of these gaps in there, it would be more difficult for you to be able to identify the moving on from one point to the next or one train of thought to the next. Here the editor has done a lot of the work for you. So, so get a Bible that has this. It will help you to see the transitions of thought a lot easier, especially if you're a beginning Bible student. Now, we're not done on outlining the text. So now that you've outlined the book from Thomas Nelson, for example, there's other good books to use, you've outlined in your own words the very chapter, then you hone in on the verses that you're actually wanting to understand the meaning of and outline those verses or the small section, paragraph, that those verses are in. I'll show you what happens when you outline verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 28. Here's the text. It kind of flows all together. It doesn't really seem like necessarily, just looking at it, that there's a whole lot of organization to it, just a bunch of words on the page. But when you really pay attention to the words, you'll notice there's some repetition in these, and it starts to pop off the page at you. So I'll use color coding to show you how that's the case. Notice the first two sentences are really repetitions of the same thought. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Now, FYI, I think the he here is God from verse 5, the Lord God Almighty. And perhaps it's referring to God teaching Israel or Ephraim through Isaiah. Regardless, whom is God or whom is Isaiah, his prophet, going to teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? The next two phrases repeat each other as well. Those just weaned from milk, babies? Those just drawn from the breasts? Toddlers? And then verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is what we call parallelism, where one line repeats the next line or vice versa, and they are slightly different, but they complement each other very much. They're called parallel statements. This breaks this down. I can now see it. It's organized. I don't know what these verses mean yet because I'm not done with all nine steps, but it's starting to take up a lot more shape, and I'm starting to feel better and more hopeful about it. So now let's go on to point number four in systematic Bible study. Okay, point number four. This is where you become a lot more directly involved with the text. Here I want you to, in your own words, write down what you believe at this point the verses are saying. And you may think, well, honestly, I still don't have really a lot of an idea of what they're saying. Write down whatever comes to your mind if you have no idea. Write it down. You have some thoughts going through your head. Put them on paper. Now at this point, this is very helpful. It's going to be encouraging to you potentially it's also going to help you mainly be objective and neutral through your Bible study. We all come to the text with some amount of bias and some preconceived idea about what the Bible is teaching on any given subject or verse. And so this point right here, this step, number four, is to help us remain neutral and unbiased rather than going straight to a commentary, which is going to tell us what that commentator thinks about the text. And it might be wrong, 
Let's read the text, see what it says for ourselves, and then write that down in our own words. Now, when I say this, I, I don't mean it has to be a long uh, whole page or something like that. Keep it brief or make it as long as you want, but I'm just telling you, just keep it brief, keep it simple. This is what mine looks like. These were my thoughts on Isaiah 28. I'll read them to you, and you can then, by the end of this study, agree or disagree with these thoughts, and I'm going to tell you that I didn't quite agree with what I wrote down initially. If that makes you feel any better about your Bible study when you have to do the same thing. When I was reading it, it just seems like, based on the very severe rebuke of verses 7 and 8, and then God's saying that he'll speak to the people in a, in a way that they won't understand in verse 11, which we didn't read together here. Uh, verses 9 and 10 must be a rebuke by God of some kind. Now that part, by the end of the study, I, I still agree with that. Perhaps God's saying in some sarcastic way that these people don't want to hear, and so he'll give them a boring message for their dull ears, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's the best I could come up with at this stage in the Bible study so far. And I don't necessarily think that this is completely wrong. I think there is some validity to what I decided at, by point number four, but we're going to shape this up a little bit and it's going to become more clear as we go through the study. Some other things that I would tell you to do, and this again is where you come into the text a lot more, is write down difficult phrases, like I told you in your Bible reading, write down those phrases in the side column of your notes. If you have a legal pad or something, write them in the side of your Bible. I have a wide margin Bible, as you saw on the previous episode. Get a Bible. You can write these questions in your margin. Now, here's an example. In this very chapter, I read this text, and in verse 1 in the New King James, it uses the phrase, verdant valleys. It says, which is at the head of the verdant valleys. I don't know what verdant means. And you might think that I'm really smart and I should know that, but I really don't. So I'm just being honest with you. I had to look that word up. Now this one particularly, I looked up on Google and I just quickly found out it means green. I also have a center column reference here. So I looked in the center column reference and it said fat valleys. I put those together and what I understand is that Green valleys are valleys that put off nice uh, shrubs, grass, lush produce, and those are what you know per make people fat or make cattle fat. So fat valleys, green valleys, putting off a lot of produce, that's the idea. So now I understand. But I had to write that down so I didn't forget and then go back and look it up. Write down difficult phrases to research. Next one is write down questions that you have about the text that are not necessarily just words you don't understand, but concepts you don't understand. So when I read verse 1, it says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Now, if you don't know much about Israel's history, this is going to be puzzling to you. You may not even know that Ephraim is a tribe, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph, you've heard the story of Joseph who was sold into Egypt by his brothers and was serving under Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife you know, came on to him. That's a pretty well-known story. Well, Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim, they were both given half-tribe status within the 12 nations later on. But Ephraim became the largest uh, tribe in the whole nation of Israel. And what's happening here and happens frequently in the prophets is Ephraim is singled out because Ephraim was in the northern division of Israel. There was Ephraim and 10 other tribes in the north. There was Judah and Benjamin in the southern half of the nation. And Ephraim being the largest tribe is often selected and called out to represent all of the northern tribes of Israel. And so when he's calling out Ephraim here, he's really calling out the entire northern tribe, or northern half of Israel. That's what's going on here. Um, now, you wouldn't know that up front. You have to read your Bible several times. You have to study your Bible. You have to, maybe you learn this through some reading some Bible commentaries or books of history on the Bible. But write this question down because you don't understand it at first. Maybe eventually you will. And here I've just given you the answer. So another thing to keep in mind in your Bible study, something else I would tell you to do is pay attention to repeated phrases as you read through the chapter. And maybe repeated phrases will help you with understanding phrases or concepts, in this case in verses 9 and 10, that you want to know the answer to. For an example, I'll give you verses 1 through 4. And if you were to read these through again, now we're not going to do that 
here in this video for time's sake, but read through them again, and I've identified for you the repeated phrases throughout the first four verses even. Now, this may not have any bearing at the end of the day on verses 9 and 10 and how you understand it, but a lot of times this will help you. Again, not always is this going to be helpful, but a lot of the times you will see that it is. Pay attention to repeated phrases that often you'll be able to identify from just simply reading the text over and over. The crown of pride in verse 1 is repeated in verse 3. And there are several things in verse 1 that are repeated in verses 3 and 4. I will say that it's kind of helpful to understand the crown of pride. It says, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. Ephraim had become proud. Israel to the north had become a very proud people. Their leaders had become very proud. This is not a good thing. And that actually is going to play a part in verses 9 and 10 because God is really accusing Israel and its leadership of being proud. That shouldn't be a surprise to us when we understand that this is a repeated phrase from verses 1 and 3. That's some basic things you need to know about uh, writing down what you think about the verse to help you be objective, to help you be neutral in interpreting the text, and some things to help you understand what's in the verses all around. Next, coming up, we're going to talk about looking up cross-references, which I have touched about a little bit, but let's get on that in the next episode. Point number five in systematic Bible study is use your cross-references. Look up verses in the cross-reference sections of your Bible. Now, not all Bibles have cross-reference sections, and I've mentioned in the introduction or somewhere in this series already that a Bible with a center column table uh, or a column right down the middle of the two columns in your Bible with verse references is very, very helpful. This is where that's going to come in handy. Okay, I've put on the screen here the cross-reference screenshot of my Bible for verses 9 and 10 of Jeremiah 28, which are the verses that we're studying. And these are all the verses blown up so you can see it easier. These are all the verses that the Bible editors of this, this Bible I'm using, the Cambridge Bible, it tells me to go look up these verses, and perhaps if I will go read these, they will help me to understand what is actually being said in verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 28. And so right now, we've talked about doing this, but let's actually do that. So turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 10. It says in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 10, To whom shall I speak and give warning, that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. In this verse, there's a commonly repeated element from the prophet's particularly Jeremiah and Isaiah, that they were sent prophets from God, but they would not hear. They didn't want to hear. They were not interested in understanding God's will. Let's read another verse from the list. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 15. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 15, we're going to read through verse 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked his messengers, or the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there were no remedy. This is getting the same point across. Does th what I'm reading right here, does that help me understand what is being said in Isaiah 28, 9 through 10? Let's read one more verse for the sake of just comprehension here. Uh, we're not going to read all of these. I would encourage you in your Bible study, Read all of the verses in the cross-references. Maybe only one of them is going to apply to the verse under consideration. In this case, I'm just telling you, I've read them all. They are all very helpful to understanding Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. But let's this time read Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 30. Nehemiah 9 verse 30 says this, Yet for many years you had patience with them, referring to Israel, and testified against them by your spirit in your prophets, Yet they would not listen, therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. So if we take all three of these passages and the rest of them that are all saying the same thing, now we go back to Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10, and we reread the text, understanding that that may be what's also being taught here. Does that make sense? Let's see if it does. Verse 9, Whom will he teach knowledge? 
And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breasts, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It seems like maybe there's a possibility that in some odd form of speech, the writer here is saying the same thing, that God has sent his prophets like Isaiah. The people, they don't want to hear. Uh, they could hear, but they don't want to. God's given them opportunity, and they keep rejecting him. Uh, maybe this is also teaching the same thing. The Bible editor th seems to think so. Let's keep on going in our Bible study and see if this still plays out. But this is very important. Always do this in your Bible study. Look at the cross-references or the ones in the footnotes if they're not a center column reference. Now, in our next step, we're going to talk about consulting Bible commentaries finally. Step number six in systematic Bible study is finally about consulting Bible commentaries. Now, it would be a mistake if the first thing you did in understanding Isaiah 28 was go straight to Bible commentaries. Again, that doesn't help you remain neutral and objective as you're studying the text. It doesn't allow you the best chance of ruling out false doctrine in a commentary. So do this not immediately. Do not jump this to number one, but wait till number six to do this. But we're finally there. We're finally ready to look to see, does everything that I've learned so far agree with what scholars seem to say in their Bible commentaries? Now, you may not have many books. You may not have any Bible commentaries to go to, and you think, oh, I can't do this one, Aaron. I, I have nowhere to go, I and I don't have the money to go spend uh, hundreds of dollars on Bible commentary sets. Listen, you don't have to. There is so much free resource available on the Internet, and there are many good Bible commentaries available for free on the Internet. I'm going to show you a screen here of studylight.org. Studylight.org I use all the time. It's got some great classical commentaries on there that you can just type in the verse you want and get right to seeing what the author says about it. Here it is. Studylight.org. Here's the home page. And right on the top left is this drop-down menu, Bible Study Tools. Click on that, and that's going to pull down this menu bar. There's going to be Bible commentaries where you can click on that and go to 128 different Bible commentaries, some on portions of the Bible, some on every verse of the Bible. Also, I'm just pointing this out because it's here, and it's a good resource as well, and that's Bible concordances. So if you want to find where a specific phrase, every time it appears in the Bible, maybe you want to go look up all those occurrences, you need to go to a Bible concordance. A good one right here I have pointed to is Nave's Topical Bible. That will help you... Uh, find similar phrases in the Bible. Uh, Bible dictionaries. Maybe you need to understand what the word verdant valley means. Well, look in a Bible dictionary. A good one is Vine's Expository Dictionary. Uh, you can use that to look up difficult phrases that you might come across in your Bible reading or study. Well, in this case, we go to studylight.org, and here I show you my favorite Bible commentaries. Now, not all of these men do I agree with everything they say. In fact, I would say there's not a single Bible commentary, obviously, that I'm going to agree with everything they say. Neither will you. But these are some very conservative scholars that you can uh, read these, and I believe that they provide a very conservative interpretation of Scripture most of the time. More times than not, I'm going to agree with them. They are not Calvinists. Uh, I think Albert Barnes and Adam Clark, I believe, are um, Arminian, which is kind of on the other side of the line from Calvinism. J.W. McGarvey and Burton Kaufman's commentary set, those are two Church of Christ preachers, and they have some very good um, words to say about the Bible all throughout. J.W. McGarvey doesn't have... Uh, but just commentary on a few select books of the New Testament. Kaufman, I believe, he covers the entire Bible. So these are some Bible commentators that I often go to. Um, they're very good, and they're going to help you get a good conservative comment, a good idea on the text. Now, I have some other Bible commentaries as well. So what I did is I went to my shelf, and I found one by Barry Webb on the book of Isaiah. I go to this verse, and this is what I found, and I found him to be the most helpful in understanding this verse. So I'm just going to put it up on the screen and you can read along with it and see if you agree. He says in Isaiah 28, 9 through 10, the leaders of Israel are insulted. 
That's what's happened in, ver- in chapter 28. They're insulted by God and by Isaiah. They consider themselves to be the nation's teachers, and they resent being treated as they see it as children. And Webb says, verses 9 and 10, the, what's stated in verse 9, the questions that are asked, this represents the leader's typical questions that they might put forth to Isaiah or to God uh, in response to the preaching of Isaiah. So let's read these verses again with that in mind. Instead of these words being from the mouth of Isaiah, these are words coming from the mouth of the leaders. At least Isaiah is mocking them, as it were, or he's speaking for them as if this is what they always say in response to his preaching or the messages of God. The leaders say, whom will he teach knowledge? Who does this prophet of God, who does God think he's going to teach? Whom will he make to understand the message? Do they think that we don't understand the will of God? Do they think that we're dumb or something? Uh, Going on, those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast, do they think that we're babies who just came off of uh, breastfeeding and, and we need milk? Like, we're priests. We're leaders of the people. And I'm sure they're wearing their turbans and their nice flowing robes. And they really think a lot about themselves. They're wearing crowns of pride, verse 1 says. And so they're taking this as an insult that Isaiah would come to them and they would, tr- and, he, and Isaiah would treat them as if they're babes, as if they don't know anything. Go on in verse 10. Again, this would be the leaders saying this. Uh, Isaiah is, he, he's given us precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. And what do you do with children? You give them the basics, the fundamentals, the precepts of the law in this case. Uh, They're like, we know the law. You don't need to give us the basics. We're not kids anymore. We didn't just come off from breastfeeding. Uh, Beyond that, Isaiah, he gives us line upon line, line upon line, repetition. This is how you teach children. You repeat yourself over and over and over, and children learn by repetition. Finally, they say about Isaiah's preaching and the message of God, here a little, and it's there a little. They preach it all the time throughout the day. They give us a little bit all the time, the same message, the same fundamentals, the same milk, like we're dumb children, babies, and they're insulted. This crown of pride that they're wearing, does that now take on more meaning? That's what Barry Webb says is going on here, and that really seems to capture and captivate the thought and brings this into perspective a lot better. Now I feel like I'm understanding the text Now I feel like I understand the text. In verses 7 through 8, there's judgment from God on the priest. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They should know better than to be getting drunk and to be living immorally. They're the leaders of the people. And so they should be insulted. And Isaiah is mocking them. This is what you're you're saying. Uh, You should be being taught like children because you're acting like children. You need to be taught all throughout the day. You need to be taught by repetition. You need to be taught uh, the basics, the fundamentals. I don't care if you are priests. You're acting like children. So now that we've consulted the commentaries, we have a difficult verse opened up to us. Now you have to dissect a lot of times. Sometimes you might come across a difficult verse and there might be four or five different interpretations from four or five different commentaries and you've got to narrow it down to which one you believe is teaching the truth on this. But all the groundwork that you've done in steps one through five is going to help you to dissect and make that distinction a lot easier and a lot more true to the one meaning of the verse. So this is a helpful resource. Go to studylight.org. Use it. But also understand that you got to pick out the bones to leave just the meat. Because there's some bones, there's some false doctrine and all this stuff. Pick out the bones and eat the meat. Let's go on to step number seven. We're not done yet. Step number seven is about what I call the law of harmony. Step number seven in systematic Bible study is called the law of harmony. The law of harmony is just very simple. It's the idea that all scripture must harmonize in its teaching from one place to the next. So if you come to a verse of scripture and you read that and you think, there's something I found in this verse of scripture that is taught nowhere else in all the Bible. Now there may be a chance that that is the case. And maybe that's so, but if this verse of scripture and this 
doctrine that is found nowhere else in some way contradicts what I know in another place of the Bible, then I need to go there, compare the two, and if these verses don't harmonize, there's a problem with the interpreter. There's a problem with me, and so I have to understand which one of these verses, maybe both of them, do I not understand because I've gone wrong somewhere. The law of harmony says that all Scripture must harmonize if it's truly the inspired and errant Word of God, then there's no doubt about it. It must harmonize. There's, for example, a Mormon doctrine about baptizing people for the dead. I met one time a ex-Mormon, and he said he was uh, his role was to go into the Mormon temple, and he was the person that would be clothed in a white robe, and they would baptize him multiple times a day. And they were baptizing him for the souls of those who were dead and lost so that those people might go into the eternal state of of everlasting life from the state of everlasting punishment. Uh, this is a Mormon doctrine that's derived from a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul makes a statement about being baptized for the dead. Now, that passage seems to contradict other places that talk about how the state of, of eternity, how the afterlife is set in stone, like the story of the lame man Lazarus. Uh, there it says there was a gulf fixed between paradise and torments, and one person could not cross to the other either way. So this seems to be a contradiction. If I come across this seeming contradiction, the problem's with me, the problem's not with the Bible. It means that the law of harmony, that test is not passed. So I need to make sure that this law passes my interpretation of this passage, in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10, uh, it seems like what we've come to the conclusion of, in fact, it's in keeping with these other passages that we looked up in Jeremiah and Nehemiah and 2 Chronicles. There's no contradiction here. So it seems like this passage does pass the test, the law of harmony. Now, there's other passages, and I want to give you examples of places where common interpretations are made about the text, and these interpretations do not pass the law of harmony. We gave you an example in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at some actual examples in the text in these verses. One that's common is in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. A lot of people like to go to Matthew 7 and verse 1, which says, Judge not that you be not judged. And if you say something that contradicts somebody's lifestyle, or maybe you say that you're, you're, you're not, I don't think you're right on that. Then they say, judge, judge not that you be not judged. Don't you know the Bible says that? You look it up on Google, ah, oh, that's Matthew 7, verse 1. You say, well, let's read that together. And you go over there, and the Bible says, sure enough, judge not that you be not judged. And you're thinking, man, this is tough. But there's other places in the Bible that, that, that seems like it would be contradicting the Bible itself. Well, let's just read the whole text. Let's see if maybe, maybe this is not passing the law of harmony the way that we're interpreting this verse, because it just seems like there's other places where things are said about convincing and rebuking and exhorting, that if, if this is true the way you're interpreting it, those passages would be contradicting. We keep on reading, and we find indeed that interpretation that this person poses on Matthew 7 verse 1 does not pass the law of harmony. Within the same passage, keep on reading, Judge not that you be not judged, verse 2, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, Jesus says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what's holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Here, pay attention to verse 5. If the person's interpretation of Matthew 7 verse 1 is correct, then what Jesus does in verse 5 is he contradicts himself immediately. He says, hypocrites. Now, what if you had told this person, hypocrite? They would get inflamed. They would say, judge not that you be not judged. But Jesus goes out and he does the very thing that he said not to do. He judges them as hypocrites. Why would Jesus do that? Well, my first inclination must be that he's not saying that all judgment is wrong. But he's saying that a certain type of judgment is wrong. Mm, that actually sounds like that might be the case. That would harmonize these two passages. Let's keep on reading. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
here he's saying, remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's not saying don't do that. Don't help your brother by removing this painful needle from his eye. Do that. You're helping your brother by passing a judgment. There's there's something there. I need to get that. But he's just saying when you do it, make sure that you can see in the first place to do it. Make sure there's no plank in your own eye. And then you can help your brother. Verse 6 says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Here he is saying, don't take the valuable riches of Christ in the word of God and don't keep casting into people that don't want it. And in order to know who's who, you have to make a judgment call. You have to know who's a dog and who's a swine and who's not in order to know who to offer, keep on persistent, persistently offering the word of God to. If somebody doesn't want it, They're a dog. They're a swine. They're rejecting the word of God. You've made every effort that you possibly can. They're still rejecting it like the Jews in Isaiah's day. And so finally, even God runs out of patience sometimes and he stops throwing his pearls before. But you have to pass a judgment on who is dog and swine and who's not. Now, in all of this, just to wrap it up, we're not saying that you should be hypocritical. That's the very point. Don't be hypocritical in all this. You shouldn't come across self-righteous. You shouldn't come across as having always something negative to say and never anything positive to say. Jesus isn't saying to be a jerk. He's not saying to be obnoxious. But what he's also not saying is that don't judge anybody ever. He's encouraging us to help each other out. Passing judgment where there's sin in our lives, just don't do that hypocritically. That helps me harmonize the truth of the subject. Another verse that helps bear this out is in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6. There's this statement where Jesus is talking about sudden destruction. And particularly if we go back to the end of chapter 23, he's looking at the temple in Jerusalem and he says, there's coming a time very soon where not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. This temple is going to be torn down is what he's saying. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Well, he says this in verse 6 of the next chapter. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, a lot of people will quote this verse and other similar verses, and they'll look at wars in the Middle East and all over the world, and they'll say, see, this is the sign of the end times. Jesus is coming back very soon in this generation, so be prepared. But let's keep on reading. What's it say? See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, But the end is not yet. He's saying wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be a lot of them. They're going to come and they're going to go. But these are not necessarily signs of the end times. Or even in this context of the end of Jerusalem. Don't don't buy into that. If we keep on reading the Bible, we keep on finding out that a lot of the things that people say are signs of Jesus coming back are non-signs. Why? Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And this is what we've got to harmonize with this initial interpretation of Matthew 24 and verse 6. Here's another verse that gives us some problems if we stick with that initial interpretation. But of that day, the end time judgment, and of that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. That's the point. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2 shares some more light on the subject. Again, the law of harmony encourages us to go read our whole Bible, read it over and over, so that we'll be able to remember, ah, I think I remember something in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2, so let's go and read it. And we find it says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When do thieves come to break in and steal? Do they leave a note on your door and say, I'm coming at Monday morning at 8 o'clock. Be ready for me because I want to come and steal your TV and your washing machine. No, they don't tell you when they're coming. When you least expect it, that's when they come. And these verses are telling Christians. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5 is telling people, don't live like Jesus is coming back um, three months from now and you, you can stop working and you can just sit back and wait on his arrival. He's saying... Live every single day the same with the same mission at full steam because you literally do not know when Jesus is coming back. There are no signs of his coming. It's just going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. 
Uh, when you hear of wars in the Middle East, that's not a sign of Jesus coming back. That's just a war in the Middle East. And so live every single day because Jesus comes at a time which you do not know. What I've just given you are a couple of examples of using Scripture to interpret Scripture and realizing all the while that the Scripture must harmonize if it is the perfect, inspired, and errant Word of God. We helped ourselves by using that law in Isaiah 20, uh, 28, verses 9 through 10, to make sure we're not teaching any false doctrine here. Now let's go on to step number eight in systematic Bible study. Step number eight in systematic Bible study is that there's only a single meaning to every Bible passage. That means if I go to those Bible commentaries, like I said, and I'm getting three and four different interpretations of this Bible passage, that means that only one of them can be correct. And you see this disregarded in, sometimes in group Bible studies where they go around in a circle, they read a passage of the Bible, and they say, what does this mean to you? Well, maybe it's interesting, and maybe that's some good discussion. What does this Bible mean to you? But if we're operating under the premise that, well, this means A to you, and if that means that to you, well, that must be the truth for you. But it means B to me, and it means C to him. Um, we'll just all agree to disagree, and we'll all get to the same place, even though uh, we're, we're not interpreting this passage the same. That's not good Bible study hermeneutics because there's only one meaning to every passage, and it's the holy, and it's the meaning, I should say, the meaning that the Holy Spirit infused into the text. I'll give you a couple of different examples here on these slides that show you exactly what I'm talking about. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says this, a commonly misinterpreted statement from the Bible. It says in 2 Peter 1 verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, many, many times I've heard this verse read, and the person goes on to say, listen, the Bible's not up to your private interpretation. It can't just mean what you want it to mean. Uh, it only has one single meaning. In fact, that's kind of the point being made, the very point. And you're saying, well, that sounds right. And you know what? What that person's saying about this passage, that statement in itself is correct. That's true. That the passage only has one meaning. I'm making that very point. The problem is, that's not what 2 Peter 1 and verse 20 is teaching. And the reason that this is commonly misunderstood is because of the English translation commonly represented here. And if you'll look again in your center column reference or your footnotes, there should be oftentimes the editor will put a footnote that for the word interpretation will tell you this can mean origin. And so if we read that again, it would read, know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private origin. And if we'll just keep on reading the text, like most cases, this will explain the contradiction. Uh, then we'll understand the text will explain itself. It says in verse 21, for no or for rather, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So you take verse 20 and you combine it with verse 21, and 21 explains verse 20. It's saying no prophecy came from private thoughts of men. Uh, rather, when Scripture was written, men were led by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote down the words that were revealed to them. What he's saying is Peter didn't just write a fairy tale. Peter didn't just write down some blog, and then they put that in the Bible. These were the thoughts of the Holy Spirit. These thoughts did not come from private origins, but they came from one source, and that source guided each of the writers. This is really a statement about the development of Scripture. Now here, again, the first statement made from this passage, you know that there's only one meaning to passage, it's not up to your interpretation, Aaron. That's a true statement. And if you told somebody that, you wouldn't be teaching them error. The problem is when you use a verse to teach, or I should say when you use the wrong verse to teach the right doctrine, and you use that bad method, then eventually you're going to come across a verse and you're going to use the wrong verse to teach the wrong doctrine. And so you need to be consistent in your Bible study. Use good Bible study methods all the time so that hopefully all the time or the large majority of the time you're using the right verse to teach the right doctrine. 
That's why step number eight is so important. In the next step, we're going to talk about the final step of systematic Bible study. Stay tuned. The final step, step number nine in systematic Bible study has arrived, and you are finally about to be done with interpreting Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10. That's where I've turned my Bible back to. Okay, you think, well, what else is there to do? We need to make this applicable. All Scripture is applicable. It's profitable unto every part of life. And so if there's a passage in the Bible, I have to take that passage and understand how is this verse applicable to 2021, about to be 2022. We need to make this practical. If we have all this head knowledge about what this verse means, but it has no relevance for our day-to-day living, then what good is it? Just to tell somebody that you know what this verse means? Pride? No, it has a practical application. Now, one writer said this, and I think this is so important. Many teachers get this mixed up. This writer said the Bible comes pre-applied. You do not pre-apply the Bible. The Bible comes pre-applied. And if you don't understand what that means, imagine, for example, I've heard very similar statements like this. You're driving down the road with somebody and they look out there across the field and they see a a deer leaping across a fence. That's a beautiful scene. And they say, ah, that would make a great sermon. And you're over there and you're scratching your head like, what are they talking about? And they're like, uh, you know, that just makes me think, you know, we can we can climb high and, and jump high for Christ. And if we'll just put all our potential and all our strength into it, we can make great leaps and bounds for the kingdom's sake. And if we'll run like a gazelle or run like a deer, we'll, uh, we'll just do so much for the kingdom, you know. And, and then they're like, they think, if I go and I find a few passages about deer and about leaping and jumping and metaphors for growing in Christ, then we'll have a great sermon. That's called preheating the oven, as I call it, or pre-applying the text. That's not going to the text, finding out what it means, seeing how did the Holy Spirit apply this message to his audience, and therefore, how would the Holy Spirit apply this text to my audience today. That's not what we're doing in that example I just gave about the deer. Now that's called pre-applying the text. Don't preheat the oven. Don't grab a bunch of passages and make a, a textual casserole. No. Go to the scripture, use the first eight steps that we've talked about, identify what does the passage mean, and then take the very application from that passage, apply it to your audience. In this case, you're just an average Bible student. You're not a teacher necessarily. Apply it to your environment and help other people understand the Word of God. So, for example, there are three different applications to this passage in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 10. There might be more, but I'm going to give you three applications, and I believe these stay true to the text. They don't distort the interpretation of the text, and they aren't pre-applying the text, as it were. I'm drawing my applications from what I know the text is saying, okay? And so, uh, I'm going to take you through these three applications. Two of them our primary applications. And I'll put forth to you that a text always has a primary application. Here's what I mean. In the first point, I would say leaders are not above the law. Isaiah 28 verses 9 through 10 is teaching us today even that leaders are not above the law. The leaders of Israel's day were being indicted. They were being rebuked. Because they thought they were above the law. And Jesus is saying, or rather, God saying through Isaiah, No, you're not. Uh, You're acting like children, so I'm going to teach you like children. You're not above the law any more than the plowman. And so that would be a perfect application for our audience today to show what the Holy Spirit is showing in this passage. Leaders are not above the law. That's one primary application of the passage. Another one is that God has spoken plainly through His servants, the prophets. That's what all those other passages in the cross-references were teaching, and that's what this passage is teaching. Through Isaiah, God spoke plainly what His will was. And that message, it can be understood. It can be understood, but we have to have open hearts. That's a primary application of this passage. If we will have open hearts, unlike the leaders here, Ephraim, Israel, and Isaiah's day, if we will understand that God has privileged us with speaking to us His message through the prophets, in our case, the written Word of God, and if we'll have open hearts and listen to what it says, 
then we will know God's will for our lives. Now, those are what the passage is primarily teaching to Israel. In that day, we carry it over to a parallel in our day. But there's also some secondary things, some things that are taught along the way that they're not necessarily what this passage was in the Bible to teach, but we certainly learn these truths nonetheless from the passage. One of the things that we can learn from this passage that's true uh, is how to study the Bible. That's why I chose this text to use as the text that we would study through for this application, for this systematic Bible study. You know, these leaders, they were upset with Isaiah and with God because they were being treated like children, like they needed to be taught basic doctrines, fundamentals, and they needed to be taught this repeatedly, line upon line, line upon line. And all throughout the day, all walks of life, here a little, there a little. That's how you teach children. And you know what? Adults learn just like children do. Back to Bible reading methods, and I told you that little practice that John MacArthur advised, read a book of the Bible every single day for 30 days. And you know what? After 30 days of line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, after you've done that for 30 days, I promise you, you will know that book. You will be familiar with that book, and you will know Even if you don't know the verse, the exact chapter, book, chapter, and verse, you will know on the left side of the page, somewhere in chapter 2, 1 John says this. You can tell somebody that because you've learned that book like a child learns. And if we will study our Bible like children study and learn from their parents, then you too, even if you're 80 years old, you can learn the Word of God. You can I I truly believe you can, no matter how old you are. Some minds work slower. Some minds are not as quick as others. That's true. But if you use these nine Bible study techniques, these Bible study tips, you too can understand the Bible. Apply the text. Remember, don't preheat the oven. Don't make a textual casserole. Make the application that's parallel to what the Holy Spirit was making in the passage to begin with. I hope now we're done, by the we are done with Isaiah 28, and I hope now that you understand what it's teaching, that you can take this application and it inspires you and encourages you to take all of this and start studying the Bible for yourself. With all that said, we're not done yet. We do have one more major point, back to our five major points, and that is to live the Bible. That next on the final episode. Thanks for watching this series. You're now on the final episode of How to Study the Bible for Yourself, and I finally want to discuss with you one last thing, kind of in the same train of thought as the last episode about making application of the Bible. We want to make Bible study practical and relevant to our lives, of course. And so in this last point, I want to leave you with the fifth thing is to live the Bible. We said starting off, you need to prioritize Bible study. You need to choose a Bible to start studying, read that Bible, Long-term goal on the yearly. You need to finally systematically study the Bible and don't forget to live the Bible. By that I mean, let the Word of God change you. Let the Word of God change you. I think of that passage in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. You know, the first time that I read that passage, I thought I understood what it meant. As I continued one day, my dad told me that that meant basically to live radically. I thought I understood when he said that a little bit better. Finally, I went through trials in my life where I was letting certain lusts and temptations uh, rule me in ways I didn't even realize. I then came back to that passage and I realized a lot of the stuff I was letting sit around in my life was ruling me and causing me to sin. I hadn't been living that passage. I thought I understood what it meant, but even if I did, I wasn't living it. And so I finally understood what it meant to cut your right hand off metaphorically, to live radically. And finally, I started cutting off things from my life that hurt initially. They caused me pain and and they interrupted my routines in life. And my life, you know, I didn't enjoy it as much in the moment, but I finally was living the Bible. And at the end of the day, my life was changed for the better. If you read the text, if you understand it, if you apply it to other people maybe, but you don't live it and let it change you, then you've wasted your time. And all this 
is for naught. Another thing I would say to you is let it change your family. Now, I have an entire five-minute Bible series called 30 Days of Family Worship, and I started this series at the beginning of 2021. It's still relevant today. And if you are a family, and I don't care if that just means you're a husband and a wife. If you're an individual, you need to do this by yourself. You need to make every day uh, Bible time with you and God. But if you're a husband and wife, take time to study the Bible together. Read it together, discuss it a little bit, and pray over it. This is called family worship. If you need have kids and you need to learn how to do this, in that series, I have several different fathers who give their advice on family worship, reasons they think it's important, and they help us walk through that and what it looks like on a practical level. You need to be doing that. If you're a father, if you're a mother and have children, you have a responsibility before God and to your children to train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and that takes on a daily routine reading the Bible with them if it truly is what it says it uh, claims to be. You need to li li uh, live the Bible. You need to let it change you. Let it change your family. You need to discuss the Bible in conversation with people. And part of that means surround your people, not surround your people, but surround yourself with people of like mind. You know, you may go to church with people and you may have been going to church with them for some time, but you may realize that just because they're a Christian does not mean that you're of like mind. They don't enjoy discussing the Bible. I've gone to cr church with Christians like this all the time. It doesn't matter what church you go to, you're going to be surrounded by some people, whether few or many, that are not of like mind in this regard, and that's unfortunate. But the church isn't made up of perfect people, and so not everybody is going to be of like mind. Uh, not that you're perfect either, you're certainly not. But you want to always be uh, trying to seek to grow in Christ. And if you're not seeking to grow in Christ, there's something wrong. You need to reset your radar. But surround your people, surround yourself, sorry, with people of like mind who want to discuss the scriptures, and that will keep you in the right frame of mind. You'll be going down the road, and you'll be thinking about the passage that you read, either to yourself or with your wife or to your kids or the verse that y'all were memorizing. You'll be memorizing on the road. You'll think that you'll want to just simply say a prayer to God while you're driving down the road. You'll be thinking about things that you ways that you can help the church because you've been meditating on this and talking to people of like mind. Let the Bible change you. Let it change your family and let it change your conversations. These are all different ways that we can take our Bible study and make it relevant on the daily. I hope this Bible study, this walk through how to do Bible study has blessed you, not because of something I've said, but because the Word of God, you can see how powerful it is when we get down to the roots of how to open it up to our understanding. Again, I hope this blesses you. Share this with people. Like 5-Minute Bible Study and start putting this to practice today.